Okay, great. So I'm really excited to be here tonight to share um, my latest book, Elegy from Mary Turner. And um, I have to say, I have a number of co-conspirators uh, who have made this book possible. So um, I really want to thank uh, Miriam Kaba and uh, Julie Buckner Armstrong and Charles Tyrone Forehand. All of those folks contributed to the book. And then of course, Jesse Kendig was our, my editor and Mark Martin was part of the design team. And then Julia Judge has done a lot of the publicity. And so I also want to plug while I'm here, just for a second, um, Miriam Kaba just published this book called We Do This Till We Free Us, which is absolutely amazing. Everyone should read that. And then if you're interested in Mary Turner, you should definitely order um, Mary Turner and the Memory of Lynching by Julie Armstrong, Julie Buckner Armstrong, who is really the leading scholar um, on this particular um, history. So I just wanted to sort of share those things and just say thank you um, for having me here. Uh, and I also want to thank the um, Willoughby Eastlake Public Library. I'm just tickled um, and really so thankful to be here. And Travis, thank you so much for hosting this. Um, I, I cannot say thank you enough. And I'm really glad that you um, have books in your library from places and small presses like Verso um, so that there's a lot of things out there and people are really interested in, in having access to those things. So I kind of want to start off just by talking just sort of with a small love letter to libraries and archives, if that's okay. Um, so uh, without archives, I could never have done this. And I think about archives kind of like quilts. You know, they're sort of like crazy quilts. When you think about history, there's all kinds of pieces and history happens to all sorts of people. So everyone has a very different view of history. And so without that, I could never have put together um, this story. Um, and so, you know, I have this story that I love, um, archivists and librarians. I was uh, in, at the Library of Congress in their archives, which is one of my favorite places to go. And <laughs> I'd spent the afternoon trying to make this microfiche film work and take pictures and I couldn't do it. And this librarian was incredibly kind and patient. And I turned to her and I said, you know, they should build temples to goddesses like you. And she said, oh, they have already, they're called libraries. And I, I, I absolutely 100% believe that with every bone in my body. Um, and I could never have done any of the work that I do without the, um, the dedication of archivists and without collectors and without people who cut things out of the newspaper and save them, you know, in hopes that maybe a hundred years from now, someone will We'll get there, you know, get a get a picture of what's going on. So I do want to just say before I get too far, far along that this is a hard book. Um, it's about lynching. It's about violence. Um, I think if you've got uh, young children, this may not be the story for them. So I just sort of want to let people know uh, to, to be thoughtful. And, um, and this story, you know, I've shared this with a number of different folks and in different venues and in, and in different ways. And um, a lot of times people's response is just silence. They just have to take it in and think about it a little bit. And so if that's, you know, how this ends tonight, it's okay, I've, I've been there. So um, I wanna, you know, one of the things that um, people say is why did you write this? What do you want people to leave with? And I wanna share a poem, I'm gonna read my book, but I have to talk about a lot of other people that have influenced um, what I've done. So um, this is Primo Levi, who wrote an amazing book about his survival at Auschwitz. And um, he starts off his book yeah. with this beautiful poem. And it's, you who live safe in your warm houses, you who find on returning in the evening hot food and friendly faces, consider if this is a man who works in the mud, who knows no peace, who fights for a bit of bread, who dies because of a yes and because of a no, consider if this is a woman without hair and without name, without enough strength to remember, vacant eyes and cold womb like a frog in the winter. Reflect on the fact that this has happened. These words I commend to you, inscribe them on your heart when staying at home and going out, going to bed and rising up, repeat them to your children, or may your house fall down, illness bar your way, your loved ones turn away from you. And so that stanza that he says, he writes, reflect on the fact that this has happened. These words I commend to you. And it's translated differently. Um, 
one translator writes, carve them on your heart. Um, and I really, that is what I really want people to walk away with. When they read this story, I do not want them to forget that this has happened in the not too distant past in our country. Um, and to remember Mary Turner in particular. So I also just want to say that um, there is no way to do work like this and not um, understand that there is a long history of um, narratives and images that have been used against African Americans that perpetrate horrible cultural stereotypes and continue sort of the act of oppression. So I, I want people to be aware that you know, there have been a number of images um, that really perpetrate horrible racial stereotypes and there's no way to sort of get away from that. Um, so uh, Julie Armstrong in her book has this one line and I, I have to share that as well. She writes, every liberal Southern white girl, that's me, um, has her scalp finch fantasy. But this story refused to be my sacrificial mockingbird and that is, you know, I, I cannot say um, after doing this work, how much that resonates with me, how much that line resonates with me. And as an artist, um, you know, I think we, we have a real debt um, to society. And so Maxine Green writes, of all our cognitive capacities, imagination is the one that permits us to give credence to alternative realities. It allows us to break with the taken for granted set aside familiar distinctions and definitions. And I hope that that's what this does, that it allows you to think back and be present in a time when, um, when this may have happened in 1918. Um, so, and I know I've read a lot and I haven't even read my book yet, but I wanna, wanna start off just talking a little bit about lynching. Um, you know, this is a this is an image um, from 1935, and I cropped uh, the person, the victim, out of this image. And this is a really famous image of lynching. You have this young girl. You know, lynchings were public spectacles, and um, sometimes they were advertised in the newspaper. Oftentimes, hundreds of white people would be there to witness um, what had happened, um, and what happens is um, basically you know, a, a wrong is committed um, or a rumor of a wrong happens. <clears throat> a mob gathers together, they become incensed of this perceived wrong. Um, and then when the wrongs cross the race line and maybe the sexuality line, um, the possibility of an armed insurrection might be part of those rumors. Um, mobs go crazy and they, they attack and kill people who have absolutely nothing to do with what's happening just because of their particular identity. And so um, usually lynchings involved torture, public humiliation, and ultimately death followed by this, you know, brutality. Um, so there's a, you know, there was postcards people made, people took locks of hair, um, you know, it was just a real, horrendous um, spectacle. And this photograph is from 1935. So not even a hundred years um, ago, these things were happening. The other thing to remember is this is from the Tuskegee Institute. While lynchings happened all over the country, um, they really were focused um, in the South. Um, and between 1880 and 1930, 2,400 black men and women and children were lynched roughly 300 whites were also lynched. So there's a ratio in that time period of eight to one. Um, and then in 2015, the Equal Justice Institute um, released a study and they basically created this inventory and found that there were 300, 900, almost, well, almost 4,000 victims of racial terror in 12, 12 Southern states from 1977 to 1950. So, you know, if you look here, um, you can really see that. The other thing they found is that Mississippi, Georgia, and Louisiana had the highest number of lynchings. However, they happened all over the country, like I said, and at least 550 people were killed by mob violence between 1880 and 1930 in Georgia. Um, so that is where this, this story takes place. And I wanted to share this with you. This is, these are ancestors of Mary Turner, who's the subject of my story. And this is her 
marker um, that was erected very close to the place um, where she was killed. And, you know, what's there's a lot of people in this story, but you have to think of all the people that are missing um, because of these lynchings. So, you know, if you can imagine this crowd of people going far back um, beyond the highway, I think that would be, you know, probably a better representation. And then I wanted to show you a close up of her monument after it was erected, you know, and this was nearly 100 years after this happened, it has been shot up, it has been run over um, to the point where it had to be removed. You can see the bullet holes um, in the monument. This is what was, finally, I think it was in the fall of 2020, someone shot it and then ran over it with a car and broke it. And so it had to be taken down and in its place, the Mary Turner Project, who I'm gonna talk a little bit about them, um, and their work in terms of preserving this uh, story erected this large steel cross. Um, it's a lot, it's be, it can be a lot harder to shoot at this particular target. Um, and then this is kind of where this happened. This is the Little River in, and this is, it's in Hahira, Georgia. And then this is where her uh, marker is. So you can travel down 122, here's the Little River and there's a little teeny road here and then it's right there. So you can still, go to that place um, where this happened. So I want to just tell you a little bit about, you know, how this story came to be. I'm an artist, um, I think in pictures. Uh, and so oftentimes as I'm learning about things, my brain is also making images to pair with that. And so I found out about the story of Mary Turner in doing research for another book. Um, and also uh, when I came across her story, I found you know, the Mary Turner Project, and they had an incredible archive. Um, but the artist that really inspired uh, this work is a woman from Czechoslovakia. Um, and she, uh, she's known as uh, maybe the first um, woman to do wordless graphic novels. And her name is Helena Bakr Bakrakova Ditrakova. And she also was inspired by other artists doing wordless graphic novels. Um, Franz Masriel, this is a fabulous image, and then Lynn Ward. And um, both of them were making these amazing texts without words um, that really kind of definitely are part of the, the history of comics, sequential art, graphic novels. So she was really inspiring. The other thing, if you buy this book, you'll notice is the handwriting. And um, that handwriting was actually inspired by postcards um, that my grandmother had collected. So my great grandfather was killed in 1918, the same year all of this happened um, in World War One, And my grandmother's collection of postcards are postcards from even before she was born. And there was a whole series of postcards and letters written by my grandmother, my great grandmother, you know, around, um, you know, his death. And she and other people that corresponded with her used a dip pen and had this very scripted handwriting, which I thought seemed appropriate for 1918 when I was thinking about this. The other thing is I wanted people to have to slow down, you know, when they read um, this book and really take in, you know, what was happening. And I wanted it to be hard to read. I didn't want it to be something they could fly through. Um, and I also want to talk about Walter White. So the text in my book is based on Walter White's um, piece he wrote called The Work of a Mob that was published in The Crisis by the NAACP. And Walter White's an amazing figure. This is a picture of him in 1916, right after he graduated from Atlanta University. And he had blonde hair and um, blue eyes, very fair skin. And he ended up working for the NAACP. And his first, one of his first assignments was to go to Valdosta where these lynchings had happened and find out what was going on. So he came into town very bravely. You know, I think only, only someone in their 20s would have the, the guts to do something like this um, and sort of the craziness to do it. He went into town and pretended to be a traveling salesman. And so he went to cafes and barber shops and just kind of, you know, asked around what happened. I heard about this. I've read about this in the papers because it was published in the papers all over the country. And he got the story and found one of the people who had participated in the mob 
um, who then gave him the names of sort of the people who the, the men who were the main instigators in this, but, you know, said, I can tell you who they are, but I don't want you to ever tell them that you know me. Um, so he writes all this down. He sends telegrams sort of saying, this is what's happened. And all this happened in May. You can see the date on this telegram is June. Um, so this is pretty fresh. And he ends up getting the names of all these people. Um, and these were men in this area. Their names, you can still see, you know, the names of their um, descendants and, you know, they're all throughout there. And these were people, um, an undertaker was one of them, a person that owned a furniture store. So these were upstanding, um, well-known, in some cases, well-heeled uh, white men. And again, this, this was in the newspapers throughout the country. So this, this came out, this is from, uh, this might have been from the Atlanta Constitution, I'm not sure, but you know, it tells in great detail what happened. Um, and th at this point, uh, only five people, not only, but five people had been killed. And of course, you know, we know now that at least 11 people um, were victims of this lynching spree. Um, and it's really interesting, the coverage in different parts of the country. So there's another piece I have that's in the book from um, New York, and they sort of say, you know, this is terrible. How can this happen? Whereas the papers in Georgia um, were just very matter of fact about what had happened. And, you know, the other thing you have to know is in 1918, the boll weevil came through and ate the cotton crop. It was terrible. Of course, the Spanish flu is happening. You have you know, World War I is still in the air and uh, Birth of a Nation had come out in 1915 and was screened again in 1918. So, uh, you know, I think all of these things played a role in how this violence, you know, was perpetrated and unfolded in terms of cultural. So this is an, a postcard from 1918, the Little River. So you can see it sort of how it was then. It looks very similar today. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to sort of start, start reading a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> in 1918, between the 17th and 24th of May, in the southern part of Georgia, specifically in Brooks and Lowndes County, a mob lynched 10 men and one woman. The woman was pregnant. Her name was Mary Turner. And you can see I've got some artifacts in the book. This is right where it is. So here um, is... Uh, um, Florida. I used to have a house in Quincy. <laughs> and then, so I drove through Valdosta quite a bit. And um, I taught in Bainbridge, Georgia, which is right here. So uh, I'm very, very familiar with this area. And Valdosta State University is in Valdosta. This is another postcard from that same time period from 1918. This is Pine Street. Um, in the book, I talk about Patterson Street, which is the main street, but I just want folks to get an idea of what things look like. Valdosta is a beautiful town and has been um, for many, many years. Um, okay, so it began in Brooks County. Hampton Smith, a plantation owner, often found farm labor in the form of black men who were arrested and convicted. These men were sentenced to jail or ordered to pay a fine Smith would pay their fines in return for indentured servitude on his cotton plantation. Um, and at this time, this is one of the ways that the South sort of made up the lack of labor after um, slavery had ended. There was a real labor problem where people were like, how do we do this without enslaved people? Um, so jails and prisons became one way to make that up that labor shortage. Sidney Johnson, who had been fined $30 for gaming, had worked on Smith's plantation in order to pay his debt. Johnson and Smith quarreled over wages and Johnson's obligations. Smith, a ruthless and unfair employer, physically beat Johnson. Johnson swore revenge. A few nights later, Hampton Smith was killed instantly by a bullet shot through his window. His wife was also struck. The shooter narrowly missed taking her life. The bullet passed very close to her heart. When Miss Smith was shot, she was pregnant. Mrs. Smith recovered from the shooting and later had Hampton Smith's child. 
So one of the things about this story that's sort of interesting is it involves two pregnant women, one white woman and one black woman. After the shootings, white men and boys came together from Brooks and Lowndes counties as rumors of conspiracy, robbery, black men with guns and cold blooded murder raced through the community. They formed a mob and began their hunt with a thirst for blood and violence. Now there's a lot of scholarship on rumors and how rumors contribute to racial violence. And within this story, there are a number of sort of um, stereotypical rumors. One, there's gonna be an insurrection that black men are gathering together with guns and gonna you know, um, overthrow you know, the white well-heeled people of town. So that was part of this. Um, there was also a number of rumors about what happened to Mrs. Smith had she been raped. Um, you know, that also played a role in this. And so a number of rumors circulated in the wake of the violence that happened on Hampton Smith's farm. And Mrs. Smith is never named. She's just known as Hampton Smith's wife in, in many of the things that I came across. On Friday, May 17th, outside of Barney, Georgia, Will Head was seized by the mob. Later in the afternoon, Willie Thompson, was also seized. Both men were lynched that night in Troopville, Georgia by the mob. Their bodies, the bodies of the dead men were shot by members of the mob over 700 times. So that's a common thing you will see in lynching is that not only are people publicly humiliated, tortured, and then murdered, but then there's a number of things that often happen to the bodies afterwards and shooting, filling them with bullets is, is one. On May 18th, Hayes Turner, a man who had served time on the chain gang for an altercation with Hampton Smith, was captured and held at Quitman Jail. Now, evidently, he, he was in trouble with Hampton Smith because Hampton Smith had beaten his wife, Mary. Um, that's one of the things that shows up in the literature. A sheriff and a clerk of court were transporting him to Moultrie, Georgia, when the mob stopped the car and took him. They lynched him near the crossroad of Morvan and Barney. His hands were still cuffed behind his back. His body remained tied to the tree branches for two days. Curious white people came from miles around on Sunday to look at his corpse. On Monday, the body of Hayes Turner was cut down and buried by men serving time in the county jail. So these were black men. On that same day that Hayes Turner was lynched, Saturday, May 18th, another man was lynched near Morvan. His name was reported as Eugene Rice and he had no connection to Hampton Smith. A week after the lynchings began, the bodies of three black men were found in the Little River. It was unknown if they were victims of the mob violence or casualties of an earlier time. Their bodies disappeared again soon after they were found. On Sunday, May 19th, 1918, now I wanna say this is before Hayes Turner is cut down. Mary Turner, who was married to Hayes Turner, spoke out against his lynching. She bravely called for justice through the courts for his murder. By noon, Mary Turner was seized by the mob. The men who seized her were determined to teach her a lesson. Mary Turner was eight months pregnant. Mary Turner's feet were bound and she was hung from the branch of an oak tree near the Folsom Bridge over the Little River. The mob doused her in gasoline and set fire to her body. When the fire had burned away her clothing, a man took a large butcher knife and slit open her pregnant belly. The child fell from her open empty wound to the ground. The baby cried out and a man stepped forward from the mob and crushed the newborn's fragile skull with the heel of his heavy boot. Finally, the mob of men and boys shot at the corpse of Mary Turner, filling her burnt bloody body with hundreds of bullets. And I will say that George, um, uh, uh, Charles Forehand, who is the great grand nephew of Hayes and Mary Turner wrote a beautiful piece for this book. And he describes it um, based on the way his family passed down that story. And, um, you know, it's, it's really something. Um, so I would urge you to read, if you are able to buy this book, to read that portion of the book. It's incredibly moving. White residents knew of the violence and death. Many were upset, some were ashamed, but they had pies to bake, they had hogs to feed. Their lives moved forward. 
They minded their own business. On Sunday, they prayed. Some spoke quietly to each other. They felt fear and shame. A few felt like it was all part of the natural order. They had the responsibility of dominion. They had to protect their women and the purity of the white race. The black men, women, and children tried to avoid the notice and anger of white vigilantes. They had spent generations living in a climate of intense terror and fear. They knew they could never let down their guard. Chime Riley was lynched by the mob. They bound his hands and feet, weighted down his body with clay cups used to collect sap from pine trees to make turpentine and threw him in the little river. There was no connection between Chime Riley and the shooting of Hampton Smith. Simon Schumann, another black man who was not connected to Hampton Smith was called to his front door in Berlin, Georgia in Colquitt County. It was in the evening between eight and nine o'clock. He was forced from his home. His family fled in terror as the mob smashed his furniture and destroyed the inside of his home. His body was never found. Sidney Johnson, who was responsible for the murder of Hampton Smith, was found in Valdosta. The chief of police took a posse of men and surrounded the house where Johnson was hiding. Both parties exchanged fire. Johnson was killed. The crowd rushed the house and dragged out Johnson's lifeless corpse. They cut off his penis and threw it in the street. Next, they tied his body behind a car and dragged it down Patterson Street in Valdosta. The mangled corpse was then tied to a tree in Barney and set alight. What remained was charred to a crisp. And that's the end of that lynching spree. There's a lot that happens afterward. Um, in the book, I wanted to, one of the things about the story that struck me is Mary Turner. You know, she's a pregnant woman. And it's hard to imagine that anyone can be lynched in the way that I've described, but it's, it's really, you know, her particular state makes it even harder to understand. And women being lynched is not often visible in the literature on lynching, but these are the names of a number of women who were lynched between 1886 and 1957. And if you look here, some of them, you know, it's only that a woman was lynched, their names are not recorded. In some instances, you'll see that it's a mother and a daughter um, or two sisters. It's, it's pretty, pretty brutal. Um, so I wanna end this part of the reading um, with this last thought. We still wait for the arc of the moral universe to bend towards justice. There has never been a full reckoning of the racial violence in our country. And there was no justice for any of the victims of this lynching spree. No one was arrested, even though their names were known. The governor knew this happened. It was a well-known story, but no one was ever arrested or tried for these murders.